Greetings! I am Herbert Erpaterp, and today I'm going to build this panther. As you can see, I can't see! Try opening your eyes. This is the 72nd scale Panther aus G late production from Vespid Models. I've been excited about this kit since I heard about it, having been rather happy with the previous offerings from Vespid, the mouse and comet. Enough waffling, let's have a look at what's in the box. We get some hull parts, which are very nicely moulded, they're crisp and neat, and I do like that the upper hull is one part, which makes for fewer chances to make a mess than if you had to glue the sides on yourself. There's a good amount of detail on both the upper and lower hull parts, which is always nice to see. The turret is also largely one part, well the top is, and it's also fairly well detailed. You'll find the bottom of the turret on the sprues, of which there are several, like this one with the tracks. And as you can see, these are link and length, and I think they look really nice. The tread detail is quite good. I did have a little bit of trouble getting these onto the tank neatly, but I would still prefer these over rubber band tracks any day. All of the parts on these sprues are neat and tidy, they're good quality mouldings. Obviously I'm no panther surgeon, so I don't know how accurate and precise they are in comparison to the real thing, but they do look good, and they're definitely well made. There's very little in the way of mould lines. It's always a pleasure to get to build a kit without having to spend most of your time removing mould lines. You might notice that there are a fair few fine small details, and obviously that's not a bad thing, but it is something you should be careful with. I would imagine some of these would not be at all difficult to break while removing them from the sprue, or cleaning them up. A basic set of decals is included with the kit. They're just numbers and a couple of crosses, which is enough, but if you do want something more for your panther, you'll have to source your own. And here's a very nice part of this kit, the metal gun. There is a plastic one included, which is adequate, but this one is a lot nicer. You also get the choice of two muzzle brakes, one a regular muzzle brake, and the other with a canvas cover, which I think is a really interesting and unique option to include. Both of these parts are 3D printed. There's a couple of small frets of photo etch, and on those there are some very tiny bits. Those of you who've been around my channel for a while will know that photo etch is not really my favourite thing. And some of these parts are really tiny, with multiple folds involved. On the plus side, the places where you have to bend them are indented or whatever you would call it, which makes it very easy to at least know where the bend goes. The other fret has the side skirts. These are way easier to bend and model damage on than plastic ones, but if you would prefer, plastic skirts are also included. The instructions are pretty good. They're nicely printed, and for the most part, they're clear and easily understood. As is often the case, there are a few places where I would like more diagrams, and diagrams at different angles to more clearly show how things should go, and in some areas the diagrams are a bit too small. From memory I think the orientation of the little photo etch skirt mounts was kind of hard to see, so it was hard to figure out their orientation. Maybe I'm just getting old and blind though. Other than that, the instructions are rather good. There are different details for different paint options, which are shown in the back of the instructions, so definitely pay attention as you're building. Obviously you can paint any variant of this tank however you like, but if you are determined to have one particular version, you'll need to pay attention to the instructions. Okay, let's glue some bits of plastic together. I start with this doohickey. I guess this is the outer portion of the final drives. A little wheel goes into place here, and it's nothing too difficult really. I glue it onto the side of the hull, but I think I put the wrong assemblies on the wrong side of the hull. I couldn't quite tell them apart, and I'd lost track of the numbers of which part was which. The reason I think this is because the wheels just got in the way when I added the tracks later on. So I do suggest being careful here. Herbert Herbert makes the mistakes so you don't have to. The little arm things for the torsion bar suspension come next. These do have a D-shaped keying, but there's enough play in them that you can in fact put these on wrong, and I initially did this. I got to the point of adding the tracks when I realised that my road wheels were a bit too low, and at some point after realising this I knocked something onto the model and it was damaged enough that instead of fixing it, I just bought a second kit. What you're seeing is my second attempt, which was much better. When putting the arms on, be sure that they're up against the little stops that are moulded into the hull. Also, as you can see, the arms face different ways on either side of the hull. This is because the torsion bars run the width of the hull and would interfere with each other if you tried to have everything symmetrical. 
time for some wheels. The idler wheel consists of three parts, and this first part has a bit of excess plastic in it that I didn't notice when looking at the sprues. Initially I thought it might be a bit of keying, but it's not. I dug it out and it's pretty rough, but I did get the wheel to fit onto the axle bit. The other version of the idler wheel looks to be a bit better, but it is obviously different and not suited to the version I'm building. The first two halves of the wheel go together quite easily, and there is keying to help with that. Then the outer ring part goes on over that. Easy enough. Road wheels come next. The innermost ones go on first, and they start at the second axle from the front, and there are four of them on each side, as you can probably see. The middle road wheels come as two parts, which need to be glued together. And then, why not glue those on? These go onto the axles not occupied by the first set of wheels. Makes sense, right? Drive sprockets are an important part of the tank's running gear, and these come as two keyed parts that go together quite nicely. They would probably stay together with friction, but I think gluing them is a better idea. Do be careful with these. The first set I put together didn't quite line up properly, and you do need the teeth to line up or they won't engage with the tracks. It worked pretty much perfectly the second time, so the errors were probably entirely my fault. The arm for the idler wheel goes on next, which is pretty easy, though it wasn't totally clear if I'd got this in the correct position. Might as well put the idler wheel in place next, which is also pretty easy, and it should be done before putting the outer road wheels on, because those overlap with the idler. I guess it makes sense to follow this with the outer road wheels, which, as you can see, go onto the same axles as the first set of wheels. So many wheels! There certainly are a lot of them. Because of reasons, the tracks are next. I start by installing the five curved sets of track links around the drive sprocket, making sure the links were around the right way for whichever side of the tank I was going to put this wheel on. I then add the longer length that will sit between the sprocket and road wheels. I glue this together now because it'll be a bit easier than trying to link the parts up with the sprocket on the tank. You can kind of see here how the little wheel on the final drive interfered with the tracks. It may or may not be on wrong, but the solution, in my case, was just to cut the wheel off. This was much easier than trying to pry the final drives off and glue them onto the correct side, if in fact they were on the wrong side at all. I'm sure somebody's going to have a cry about that. Uh, you didn't leave the wheel on, it's wrong! <laughs> but the fact is, you can't see it when the side skirts are in place, so I don't really care. A result of gluing the links around the drive sprocket is that it was hard to get the lower length of track into place, so I had to do a bit of dentistry and remove a couple of teeth. Other than that, installing the rest of the tracks is fairly simple. They're a lot like just about any other link and length track set. I do suggest taking your time with them and making sure you've got them where you want them before moving on to the next part, giving the glue time to bond. If you let the glue bond, the tracks won't shift when you add the next link. This of course can be a bit of a gamble because sometimes you do want the previous link to move. Use your own judgement when doing this kind of thing, is really what you should be doing. The bit around the idler wheel was a little bit troublesome, either because I didn't have the idler in the right position, or because there is a bit too much track. I kajiggered it so the worst looking bit would be on the upper section of the idler, and therefore hidden by the skirts. They're certainly not the worst link and length tracks I've dealt with, but they're not the best either. It would be nice if they had some keying, but they're not too hard to do without it, and they do look nice when they're on. They've got very good tread detail. Next, I add the hull rear, and it fits pretty well, but just to be sure, I test fit with the upper hull, and I'm happy to say that it fit very nicely. If you're building paint option 3 or 4, you'll need to drill some holes in the rear plate here before it's too late. I start working on the upper hull, and the first thing I do is remove the moulded on nubs where the lift hooks will be. This is an optional step, but you do need to do this if you want to use the photo etch lifting hooks. And well, I'm not thrilled about it, but that is what I chose to do. Obviously be careful when removing these nubs, and try not to slice any of the detail, or yourself. Both of those are bad options. I follow this by gluing the whole machine gun into its mount. Clearly the gun is a very small piece, but that's not a difficult thing to do. Nor is it difficult to install on the front of the hull. A little pressure, not on the gun, and the part is on. This, I guess you would call it a cowl or a hood, for the driver's vision device goes on here. Nice and easy. There's also a little thing, I guess it's an air intake, that goes on the engine deck here. 
It was a little bit fiddly to get this into place facing the right way, but it looks good so maybe it was worth the fiddling. Hatches for the driver and I guess the radio operator and machine gun firer go on next. These go into place nice and easily and friction holds them in place for now, but as always, glue things if you don't want them to move and probably get eaten by the carpet monster. There are handles that should go on these hatches, but I figured adding them before the installation would make it a bit harder to press down on the hatches, so I add them after the hatches were in place. These are small and thus fiddly, and cleaning up the sprue remnants from these is hard because of their size, so I'll clean them later once they are bonded into place. It saves me trying to hold onto this tiny little piece while I'm trying to slice the nub off with my knife. The headlamp goes into place on the left mudguard, and this is also fiddly, but only because it's so small. How about some photo etch? Yay. I didn't have any toothpicks for a neater superglue application, so I cut a cotton bud thing to a point and used that. The engine deck grills are pretty simple to get into place really, and they fit nicely into the little recesses. They should face a certain way, and you can tell which way that is when you look at the parts. One side is a bit less detailed than the other. I think these look rather good. The round grill for the fan goes on the right side in much the same way, though it doesn't have the recesses which guided the rectangular parts, so you've got to be a bit more careful. I've got the mesh at a bit of an angle and it's not in line with the body, which bugs me a little bit, but it's probably not important. Next I put together this, I think it's an air intake? This ring goes on the inside of the larger bit, and then it goes onto the front of the hull top here, like so. I add this handle to the engine deck next, and like those on the front hatches, once this is bonded into place, I'll clean it up with a good sharp knife. Why not join the upper and lower hull parts together? This is pretty easy, and the fit is really nice, though still a little bit of extra glue and some pressure should make it look a bit better. Shackles come next and these easily clip over their mounts. They would probably stay there with friction, but as always, the glue god compels us to bond everything into place. The instructions say to do this a bit later, but I added the rear shackles at the same time. Because I'm a rebel, and because why not? It's probably not going to hurt anything. On the front of the hull, I add this angled vision device. It's nice to be able to look out that way, I guess. I then started adding the tools, with this thing. There isn't really any keying for it, but you can sort of see where it should go based on the little rack thingy that it's mounted onto. And there's another one of these for the other side. Let's do some more photo etch. This time, it's going to be fiddly. This tiny little thing is going to be a mounting bracket for the side skirts. You need to do a few bends on this tiny piece, and I use tweezers to do this. And there's a reason I only did one of the 12 of these on stream. There was a little bit of swearing, and frowning, and pouting, and crying. Well, maybe it wasn't quite that bad. I actually did these one at a time over the course of several hours, just to try and avoid getting annoyed. And I am complaining about this a lot, but it is really a nice little detail. Though they will almost certainly be hidden behind the skirts, unless you leave those off. Because of that, I think it would have been nice if there was an alternative part with a bit less bending required. I mean, there's an alternate gun and alternate side skirts, so why not alternate side skirt brackets? Oh well, I bent them and most of them look like they're bent properly, so I might as well install them. They get glued with super glue onto a little plastic strip that will form the ledge above the side skirts. Because both brackets are different and you don't want to put the wrong ones on the wrong side, what I did to keep them separated was to use some old Pringles can lids with a number in them and keep them separated that way. It's a simple trick but boy does it make life easier. Because the instructions are printed so small it was kind of hard to see which way around these should go onto the plastic part but I got them all on in the right spots in the end. The part can then more or less be dropped into place on the side of the hull, and obviously you're going to need some plastic cement to hold them in place, otherwise it'll just fall off. That was a lot of fiddling and I didn't really enjoy it, but it does look good. Next, I add more tools to the side of the hull, like this shovel. Tank crews love digging, so a shovel is a must have. I put this on now because I wanted to make sure the shovel wouldn't interfere with the side skirt thing. Some wire cutters follow that, which is simple enough, they just needed a little bit of nudging so that they're not sitting at some weird angle. The gun cleaning kit goes on next, and there's nothing too tricky about this. I follow that with spare track links. You can install however many of these you want, 
well, I guess up to three, because no more than three will fit in the space. I like having three on both sides just because I feel like it adds some interest when the model is painted. Next, I add one of the photo etch lifting hooks, which, as you can see, is tiny. You should be able to use the marks left behind from the knobs that were cut off earlier to figure out where all of these go, and I only attached one of them at this point because I just didn't really feel like doing them on stream. I did them off stream because I wanted to take my time with them and because it's not really fun. There are two different types of hook parts here, so pay attention to the instructions to figure out where they go. Again, it's printed pretty small, so look carefully. Now, back to adding bits of plastic to the hull sides. Like this thing, which might be a jacking block, and it's quite easy to install thanks to the keying. I follow that with this thing, which is some sort of bracket. Maybe it's for mounting cables or something. It did take a little bit of fiddling to get into place, but it is in place. And now, even more photo etch. Please forgive the poor focus here. No, I don't think I will. Okay. What I'm doing here is adding the little photo etch fan to the underside of the other round grill, which is pretty simple, there's no bending required, but I did have to trim down the fan blades a bit so they wouldn't interfere with the box that this is going to mount onto. This does mean the blades aren't perfect, but I'm not super worried about it anyway. Also, it wasn't totally clear if the fan should be glued to the underside of the grill or further down into the casing. I chose to do it this way because it'll be a bit more visible. I then attached that assembly to this housing. I've no idea what it's called or what it does, but I assume it's got something to do with cooling, or maybe heating, or maybe sauerkraut. This is pretty simple to put on, but just to make things a bit more fiddly, this ring should go around the edge of the grill. This part is very thin and easily bent, and that's what makes it tricky to place, but place it I did. Next, I add these little plates to the bottom of the whole rear stowage bins. The angle of the parts in the instruction diagram made it kind of hard to tell how this should go on, but I think I figured it out. On top of those, I add some more photo etch, this time a bit more simple. I glue the photo etch lid onto the plastic box, and the one in this example does look to be cut a little bit weirdly. It's a bit more narrow at one end than it should be, and that's not something I've done, I didn't do that. It came that way. Still, the lid goes on, and then you bend the hinges down to conform to the shape of the box. Why not now install that little fan box thing on the engine deck? It's much better than having that hole there. There is some keying here, but it's got a good bit of play to it, so you'll have to eyeball the positioning a bit. This part is one of the reasons I didn't install the engine deck hooks before. It does have some hooks that should go near it, and I didn't want to have to reposition them if I'd put them a bit too close. Might as well put those stowage boxes onto the hull rear next. There's a couple of pins and corresponding holes to mount these parts, so it's nice and easy. And now there's somewhere to put our extra sauerkraut. I follow that with this thing, which is some sort of latchy doodad. This is easy enough to install, and I do appreciate that this is one part, rather than a bunch of tiny bits that need to be connected, or even worse, photo etched that needed a bunch of bending. Above that, I place the jack. This is also simple to get into place, and there's a small raised rectangle in the centre of the hull rear for this to be mounted to. I still haven't finished adding all the tools to the hull, so why not add the fire extinguisher? There's no keying for this. Well, there kind of is, there's a couple of very tiny nubbins on the bottom, but they're not going to do much guiding. Still, it's not hard to get into place. Then we have this. I'm assuming this is the hand crank starting handle. Whatever it is, it's easy to place. And that's the important thing. Finally, there's this rack of tools. Nice rack! Ha ha ha! Quiet you. This was a little bit janky to place, and it doesn't quite seem to fit in where the spare track links are. I forced it as much as I felt comfortable with. Nothing broke, and it looks like it's in about the right spot. The hull is not yet completed, but why not start on the turret? If you build it as the instructions instruct, you can have a moving gun. You would need to attach these trunnion things to the inner mantlet bit, and you'd need to do that without gluing them. That would then slip into the back wall of the front of the turret, and then you'd carefully glue it to the mantlet so it should all stay movable. I'm not interested in that feature, so I simply glue the mantlet onto the front of the turret wall. This is much easier to do, and you won't see any of that internal stuff anyway. I then glue the top and bottom of the turret together, which is nice and easy. There's a helpful guide around the inside of the turret that helps line things up quite well. 
The front of the turret goes on next, which, if you ask me, makes a lot of sense. Then we can start adding details, like the commander's hatch, which, if you want, you could model open. I usually prefer to have my tanks buttoned down, so I haven't modelled it open. Next I add this, is it a hatch or just a cover? It's got a kind of weird looking shape around the bottom that makes it look like some sort of air vent. Whatever it is, it's quite simple to place. Then this angled vision device goes here. I assume this is for the loader so that they can enjoy the scenery. Now it's time to add some more handrails and lifting rings. These are all very small and you might find tweezers to be quite helpful when installing them. As before, I'm going to let them bond into place before removing the little burrs from the sprues. This is to avoid losing or breaking them by trying to clean them up while holding the tiny, tiny parts in my fat fingers. Next comes this thing, and I've no idea what this is. It's some sort of plate thing that goes on the outside of the hinge point for the commander's hatch. Ah yes, one of those! The commander's vision devices come next. There are two different parts for the front and rear devices, and these have keying. They're small so they're fiddly, but not especially difficult to place. Once they're on, the rest of the vision devices can be added. These are all the same as each other, which seems like an odd way to do things, but I suspect there's a reason for it. On top of the vision devices, I add the machine gun mounting ring. There's no keying for this, so if you prefer, it could be left off without any ill effect. It also means if you do want to install it, you've got to do a bit of eyeballing and nudging. There's a third lift ring for the rear of the turret, and this has a support bracket on its right side, which actually helps with the installation, so that's nice. Above the rear hatch there's a probably quite helpful handrail. Again, it's fiddly only because of its size, and it will be cleaned up a bit later. There's also a handle on the hatch itself, and the same things I said about the previous railing apply here too. That's enough turreting for now. It's time to assemble the exhausts. The ones I'm using have these little two-part cowlings that I've glued together here. They go together nice and easily, and then they simply go into place on top of the exhaust muffler thingies. Do make sure that they are lined up nice and straight. In reality I'd let that bond for a while so the parts wouldn't shift out of place when trying to add additional parts, but through the magic of editing we can do this all in one go. The exhaust pipes both mount to some little mounts. These are different for each side. I think these exhausts look pretty cool. There are two other styles of exhaust pipe in this kit, and I've chosen one of the two that require photo etch mounting brackets, because I just love photo etch, I guess. I used the exhaust itself to try and bend this bracket to the right shape, and it is something close to effective. I probably whined about photo etch quite a lot when I was streaming this build, but I am thankful for the little lines that indicate where to bend. They certainly make the angular bends much easier. The curved ones aren't so good, but we could say that it's battle damage, right? I mount the brackets onto the hull because that seemed a better way to do things. Then I glue the exhausts on. This isn't especially difficult. You may need to apply some pressure, and that's fine and dandy. Just don't press too hard on the photo etch brackets. They may be metal, but that doesn't mean that they're strong. And now, why not continue with some hull details? Like the travel lock for the main gun. These two parts of it go together like so, which is nice and easy. Something I like about this is that you can model it with the gun in place, and so the bit that goes around the gun is also a part that needs to be glued on, and I think I got this around the right way. That assembly is then installed here at the front of the hull. This is not especially tricky. I feel like it might be a bit more of a challenge to model the gun in the travel lock, though it wouldn't be too hard if you would glued everything in place. I'm not going to do that, but it is nice to have that option. Back to the turret where it's time for some more photo etch. I bend this thing into a flat bottomed V shape. The etched in bending points make this nice and easy. Whatever it is, it goes in front of the commander's cupola here. And if you thought that was the last of the photo etch, you are wrong. Dead wrong. I forgot to video myself bending this bit, but without the correct tools this was a bit of a pain. One of the long edges needs to be bent at a 90 degree angle. This goes at the top of the mantlet, and there's a little notch in the metal part which links into that little nubbin on the mantlet. Then come three of these little plate things. These should have a slight bend in them, though I'm not sure I got them bent at exactly the right angle. Close enough for me though. I mean nobody's going to be measuring this and getting mad at me for having the wrong angle, are they? Not on the internet, no way. 
The first one goes here, and I don't know what it does there. Maybe it's for bolting stuff onto the side of the turret. Who knows? The other two go here against that larger plate over the top of the mantlet. This is pretty simple to do, really. But I'm still going to whine and complain because photo edge. Next, the turret top machine gun. This is, as I assume you can see, a really tiny and very nicely detailed set of parts. You'll notice there's a bipod for the gun. This was annoying and too fiddly and it didn't actually want to stay on the gun, so I gave up on it and threw it away. I'm fine without it, even if it does make some ding dong on the internet mad. The very thin, delicate mounting bracket thing, for some reason consists of two parts, and this was annoying to try and glue together, but I did manage to do so. That assembly can then be installed on the machine gun ring on the turret, and it pretty much just hangs in place, though obviously glue will make sure that it stays there. Then I add the gun, which can pretty much be dropped right into place. Easy. A little bit less easy was installing the photo wedge anti-aircraft sight. This is a really cool little detail, which is why I wanted to add it, even though it was quite frustrating to do so. It took a while, but I got it into place, and it looks great. I just hope my airbrush doesn't blow it away when I prime the model in a few decades. Now it's time for the main gun, which I think looks amazing. As I mentioned earlier, there is a plastic gun with the kit, but this is so much nicer. I was actually pretty tempted to use the muzzle brake with the canvas covering, but I think that would make more sense with the gun locked into the travel position, really. And the regular muzzle brake does look really good. Also, it's very easy to get into place. You don't have to worry about its positioning at this point, but when we mount it to the front of the turret, you should be careful to have that little nubbin facing upward. I found this gun to be very satisfying. And now, the final bit of photo etch. The side skirts. As with the gun, there are plastic parts you could use here, but why not use the photo etch ones? Especially after installing the photo etch mounting brackets. I suspect there are more realistic thickness than the plastic ones too. Plus, you can damage them nice and good. I probably did go a little bit overboard with that, but hey, it's my tank. I do what I want. The way these attach to the hull is with the aforementioned little photo etch brackets that were so very annoying to bend into shape. Also, they should be attached from rear to front. They overlap, and they overlap in such a way that the forward plate goes over the outside of the rearward plate, if that makes sense. A thin part of the brackets needs to be bent back out so that it can go through the holes in the plates, and then when the plates are on, it can be bent back, and that should hold the skirts in place. It's not especially difficult to do, though it is kind of fiddly, and you may find you need some super glue to keep the plates where they should be. The turret can then join the hull, using everybody's favourite, a simple locking tab mechanism. And that's it. The Vespid Panther Ausforung G, in 72nd scale, is now completed. And I do rather like this model. I think it's really cool and very well detailed, especially for this scale. I did of course make a couple of mistakes here and there, and it was a bit annoying to have to buy a second kit. I really should be careful with weighty objects on the modelling table. But, having two of these, I do plan on using the turret from the second kit to make a bunker turret embedded into a street, so I think that's going to be pretty cool. It won't be happening right away, but eventually. The kit was relatively fun to build. There were some annoying bits, mostly the photo etch. You may enjoy photo etch yourself, but I'm not a big fan of it, so it does take away some enjoyment for me. That said, I can't argue with the results, and I won't. All in all, the build was mostly fun and a good experience. Not everything can be perfect, I suppose. Vespid is a pretty new model company, and I think this is their third kit. They did release a couple of versions of both the Comet and Mouse, but I would really still count that as two kits. So that would make this their third kit, and I think it's quite impressive for a third release. I mean, there could certainly be improvements for future releases, like in the instructions, where I think some of the important small details could be printed just a little bit bigger, so that you can be sure that you're following the instructions correctly, and not mistakenly putting parts backwards because you can't see how they go. Also, more clear angles for some of the parts. Looking at a panel, for example, side on, without being able to see any of the detail on the front is not especially helpful. I think clarity is a bit more important than having every single diagram with a consistent perspective. The metal gun and 3D printed muzzle brakes are awesome, 
and the end result is rather good, so I think it's worth the little moments of annoyance and the fiddliness. Obviously I wouldn't recommend this kit for a brand new beginner modeler, but if you're looking for a challenge that involves some tiny bits and photo etch, this is certainly a kit I would suggest you try. Especially if you like panthers, because, well, this is kind of a panther, isn't it? I believe that Vespid also offer a Yag Panther, or will soon offer a Yag Panther, and I would imagine that shares a lot of parts with this kit. I haven't yet seen that available in any of the hobby shops I usually use, but I haven't really searched too hard either. Anyway, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, head on over to my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash herbert underscore erpaderp. The link is in the description below if you don't want to type that in. And if you've not already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube for the low low price of zero dollars. That's right, zero dollars. Or if you have the means, and you want to help a Herbert Erpaderp do Herbert Erpaderp things, and see my videos a bit early, consider becoming a patron. Links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media can be found in the description below. And as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, have an amazing day, and thanks for watching. Farewell.